than the input power needed to power it. It's an interesting design which has got four sets of three stator magnets surrounding a rotor which has got three magnetic poles. The method of generating three outward facing north poles in the stator is a little unusual but it obviously works very well. Here is an outlet or an outline diagram of the complete motor. The left hand part of the diagram shows the front face of the motor with its 12 red electromagnets uh, of the stator surrounding an unusually shaped steel rotor which is shown coloured in yellow. The right hand part of the diagram is a cross section through the motor as shown by the line here for the cross section marked 2. So this is the cross section here. You have a horizontal uh, axle and the uh, two yellow rotor pieces are keyed presumably into the horizontal shaft itself. Shown in blue here are four electromagnets, sorry I beg your pardon, four uh, permanent magnets um, which have got the their north face facing the um, mild steel um, rotor piece here. So the north is on this side, the south is on this side. North, south, north, south, north, south. The blue rectangles are, as I said, permanent magnets, but he describes them as being a ring of magnets, although it's not immediately obvious why a ring magnet should not be used. Perhaps none were available with the necessary diameters. He also says that the magnets are bolted to the rotors, which will be keyed securely to the horizontal axle. The frame material supporting the ball bearings and electromagnets is any suitable non-magnetic material. And while aluminium is mentioned, I would strongly recommend that neither aluminium or nor copper is used, especially since plastic chopping board material is very cheap and very robust. It is thought that aluminium is non-magnetic, but in actual fact aluminium is strongly magnetic, even though magnets do not stick to it. It has a very negative effect on magnetic fields. In fact, um, Howard Johnson produced a very nice and very effective permanent magnet only um, motor which worked very well indeed but when he went to create a free prototype version of the motor ready for manufacturing he found it wouldn't work the reason being that his original was built with wood which is non-magnetic and he used aluminium for the pre-production prototype and the aluminium has a very destructive effect on the magnetic fields in its immediate area. But anyway, coming back to this particular motor here, the steel rotor is, is made of two of these um, shaped pieces shown here in yellow. And you see the orientation of the permanent magnets bolted to it. North is facing the steel rotor and south is facing away from it. The actual arrangement is that the coils themselves are wound between the two end supporting pieces of this particular arrangement. Because each of the inner magnets are attached to steel rotors which are three poles each you get three north poles at one end and three south poles at the other end. The axle of the motor is good quality stainless steel and as that is both robust and non-magnetic uh, it works very well. 
The switching of the supply current is similar to that of the method used by Charles Flynn with his magnet motor. And Terry Lewis motor has been measured with a coefficient of performance over 3, which means that the output power is more than 3 times that of the input power. The input power switching occurs 4 times per second, or 4 times per revolution I should say, and it occurs just as the leading edge of the rotor arm approaches an electromagnet. In this particular arrangement here, in this diagram, the part shaded in grey is his representation of the most powerful part of the magnetic field. The uh, electromagnets marked in blue are powered up and so they are strongly attracting the north pole of the rotor which is shown here in yellow and that tends to draw it across but as soon as the leading edge of this yellow rotor reaches the trailing edge of this stator electromagnet the uh, current is switched off to that particular group of three electromagnets and then the electromagnets marked one are then powered up and the process continues and that causes the rotation of the motor in this particular diagram here the electromagnets shown in blue are just being powered up and that draws the yellow rotor arms in a clockwise direction toward towards the powered up electromagnets the magnetic force is in attraction mode and while this is slightly less powerful than repulsion mode it does not have an ad adverse effect on the magnets whereas repulsion mode can after some years uh, diminish the power of the permanent magnets versions of the motor he states that the result of a test run on his motor using pure steel as a magnetic material steel was 30 millimeters thick with teeth uh, of 218 millimeter diameter and notches of 158 millimeter diameter a 1000 gauss ferrite magnet was used as the permanent magnet electric power of 19.55 watts was applied to the electromagnets that is 17 volts at 1.15 amps this produced 100 revs per minute with a torque of 60.52 kilogram centimeters and that is an output of 62.16 watts while Teru suggests doing it that particular way I would suggest perhaps that you might use a, a rotational speed which is determined by the power supply and a, an, un, an adjustable electronic circuit. A simple power supply would allow you to give speed control. The speed control is adjusted by the variable resistor here which is 2 mega ohms. The pulsing system which is used uh, in this particular input goes in at um, pin 14. You arrange this chip which is a CD4022BC chip to give four particular outputs one after the other. This is a divide by eight device but if you connect pin 11 to pin 15 it acts as a divide by four chip and it has four sequential outputs here. The people who make chips like to think of the first output as zero. Personally I would think of it as one but anyway. Um, the outputs then are naught, one, two, three, naught, one, two, three in sequence. The zero output is taken from pin two of the chip the one output is taken from pin one of the chip, the two output is taken from pin three of the chip, and the three output is taken from pin seven of the chip. That uh, is an effective way of getting the sequence that you want. The output zero is connected to the blue electromagnets uh, in the previous 
um, full voltage across each of them. The one outputs are connected to the electromagnets marked 1, again in this diagram above. The ones are the electromagnets which immediately follow the CD 4022BC divided by 8 is made to act as a divide by 4 by connecting its pin 15 to its pin 11. And so the four sets of coils are powered up one after the other in a continuous sequence. Perry was in a meeting in America discussing getting his motor design manufactured when the meeting was gate crashed by members of Japanese organized crime who intimidated him to such a degree that as a result his motor was never manufactured. One could see a large version of this motor being used to produce a fuel-less cycle, possibly motorcycle, possibly electrical bicycle. The notes that I'm reading, trying to read from here are available to you if you want to download them. They're at www.freeenergy info.com forward slash k-a-w-a-i dot dot pdf Years ago, it was difficult to get a good source of lighting. Nowadays, with the LED lighting systems available, it is much easier. People are familiar with the concept of running a light from a battery and then recharging the battery, possibly using a solar panel or wind power generator or even the mains. However, we really want to be able to recharge the battery when there's no daylight and no wind and no main supply. What I personally would like is a light which works whenever I switch it on and which uses a battery which I never have to recharge. While that sounds a bit far-fetched, it's actually achievable if the battery is recharged when I'm asleep. Let's see what can be achieved using the knowledge which we already have. In the November edition of the magazine Everyday Practical Electronics, in the section of the magazine entitled Ingenuity Unlimited, Mr. Z. Kaparnik showed one of the most simple and robust circuits ever produced. That circuit is called the Jewel Thief, and originally it was intended to light a 3 volt LED using a dry cell battery which had been exhausted and run down to half a volt or so. The Jewel Thief circuit is very, very simple using just one transistor, one resistor, and one coil. Mr. Kaparnik wound his coil with just a short length of wire, making just a few turns on a tiny ferrite toroid. The circuit looks like this. You have a ferrite toroid ring, wound with two strands of wire, which is called a bifilar winding, and the two strands of wire are connected together. The end of one is connected to the start of the second winding and the plus of the battery is connected to that joint. Then the one of the other windings that comes off, one end, goes through a 1K resistor to a, a transistor. In this case, the transistor is a 2N2222 type, which is a high gain 800 milliwatt transistor. The transistor oscillates as soon as you switch it on due to the feedback between the two coils wound round the ferrite ring. It oscillates and produces a high voltage. A 1 volt battery produces 19 volts on the ones that I've built. The LED, which is powered by the circuit, is connected...